You mentioned the Guardian study earlier. Can you can you say a little bit more about what that study is? So the Guardian study, um, as you can imagine, based on what I started out the conversation with phenylketonuria, is um, I've always been uh, wanting to be able to get information that people could use to be able to maximize health and being able to just be the best person they could be. And I started out in 1996. I, again, had started out in the space of PKU decades ago and um, had been studying a disease called spinal muscular atrophy for about a decade with colleagues of mine. And this is a neurodegenerative condition and used to be the most common genetic cause of death for children less than two years of age. And I realized um, starting in 1990, uh, rather uh, um, starting in 2016, that we were just at the cusp of potentially a treatment that might slow down or stop the neurodegeneration. Yet, tragically, if we didn't identify babies before they started showing symptoms, it would be too late. That is, we'd have this window of opportunity. So we started out a newborn screening program for SMA, and then babies that were identified through that had the option, if they wanted to, of going into a clinical trial. That ended up being quite synergistic in the sense that we did identify babies who would have been predicted to have the most severe type of SMA. They did get into early clinical trials right away. They did benefit from those. That helped in terms of the ultimate evidence that was necessary to show the efficacy of those treatments. And because of that, um, and because we were able to show that we could do it technically and that people wanted it, um, SMA has been added to the recommended universal screening panel for babies across the United States. And so now 4 million babies born each year in the United States are screened for SMA. And we have three FDA-approved treatments, including a one-and-done gene therapy. So babies can now be identified within the first week or two of life, get a one-and-done IV infusion of the gene, and uh, go on to have uh, uh, much, much better life, if not, uh, you know, be quote-unquote normal, at least as far as we can see so far. So that got me thinking about um, sort of doing this on larger scale. We've since done a newborn screening study for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and just recently actually was FDA approved a treatment for, for DMD, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, but I'm, I don't know, I'm getting older and I'm getting more impatient and I didn't want to do these one by one. I started thinking about how could we do these at scale for population health, but not just for one condition at a time, but how could we do it for dozens or hundreds or uh, potentially even more conditions. And so uh, the Guardian study actually stands for something. It stands for genomic uniform screening against rare diseases in all newborns. And if you put the letters together from that, it spells out Guardian. Then the idea behind that is to take that same newborn screening dried blood spot that we use already for PKU that we talked about, sequence the genome, we don't need to read out everything in the genome. We only read out the genes that we consent people to read, to that, that they consent to in the study. And those genes are genes that have, I call it news we can use, information that has treatments immediately available. And in planning the study for almost uh, four years or uh, just over four years with families, we had many, many iterations about what they wanted, what they wanted us to screen for, what should be, what should enable them to be the best parents and give their children the best uh, chance at a healthy life. And we thought about also this dynamic change in what we'd have treatments for. The fact that the world is changing rapidly and we wanted the flexibility that if a new treatment became approved tomorrow, boom, we could instantly change the screen and be able to implement that. We wouldn't have to wait a decade to gather the evidence to do that. We wanted to be nimble and flexible. So the reason for using the genome as the backbone is it gives us that infinite flexibility to be able to adapt and to be able to move the field forward. So we've been doing the Guardian study in New York City since September 2022, and right now have screened just over 3,000 babies. And it really has been remarkable to me in terms of being able to see um, just the broad support from our community in doing this. In New York City, uh, you should realize, you most of the listeners probably do realize the wonderful diversity we have in New York City. That is that of the people who participate, um, it's not just uh, 
white folks. It's not just people who are from Ireland. We were talking about Irish um, uh, individuals in PKU, but it's people from around the world. We have um, about a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, quarter of people of European ancestry, of Latina ancestry, of Black ancestry, of Asian and other ancestry. So it becomes really, I think, representativeness or representative basically of the world. Um, and it also is geared to leave no baby behind um, because newborn screening is kind of this one universal thing where everyone goes through the health system in the same way. And by making this free and being able to uh, allow everyone to enter if they so chose, uh, we can really see also what people, what people, information people want and what they don't want. Um, within this, I guess one of the things that's been refreshing to me is to see that about 74% of parents that we approach and offer this to decide they want to do this. And that's an important number to me. When we did this for SMA, the number was 93%. When we did this for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it was 84%. And so within this, it's not 100% of people who want any of these genetic screens, and that's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to force anyone to do anything, but it's also not 10%. Um, the majority of parents are saying, yes, if there's something I can do to ensure that I have a healthier child, like impact, like give it to me, like help me be a better parent. Why would I not want to do this is mostly what we hear. Uh, within this, I also appreciate, and we do this with regular newborn screening, just the traditional newborn screening. And we realize that traditional newborn screening isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. I never thought it was, nothing ever is, but we realize that adding this additional dimension, and we've even done it for PKU within this study, this an additional dimension helps us to do a better job. And so just as an example, uh, we've also identified part of newborn screening identifies some children with severe combined immunodeficiency, um, a problem where you can have an overwhelming infection and die from this, but a treatment is available, including a bone marrow transplant. And so because of that, we have as part of newborn screening um, a way to screen and identify some, but not all children that have that. We've added this now genome sequencing to enrich and improve that, and in fact, identified a baby that was missed by our traditional newborn screening for SCID, um, yet is at increased risk in terms of this overwhelming infection, but yet with the opportunity to intervene at an early stage when a bone marrow transplant will be most effective. Um, and so there are numerous examples where we've identified whether it's Wilson's disease, whether it's severe combined immunodeficiency, whether it's achondroplasia, but other conditions that are treatable that we just needed to identify those babies. And as we've done that, the number of children that, and I just know because I've been practicing in New York City for 25 years, I know sort of how people navigate the system and, and how they get through. And we've been able to really get to many of the people who are usually um, unfortunately left behind, either because they're immigrants, they don't speak the language, they don't have the same health insurance. Uh, but individuals that we're seeing come out positive for this are very, very different in terms of reflecting our community than the people who navigate the healthcare system and get in to see us. And we realize based on other studies that we've done that most of the children that would have been diagnosed if ever they were diagnosed, on average aren't diagnosed until somewhere between eight, nine, 10 years of age. And so we're intervene or we're able to identify them literally a decade earlier uh, before a lot of damage has been done to their body. So it's just the beginning. You know, 3000 is great. I think it demonstrates that we can do this. I think it tells us what our community wants out of this. Um, it shows us some pitfalls in terms of how it's hard to do and what we need to do to do it better. But I do feel fully believe that this both de-risks this in terms of being able to also have um, groups that are working on therapies uh, be able to realize that this is something, there's an opportunity now for treatment for this, and is a powerful way of moving forward health equity, at least for children for the next generation. Is this something that's done only at Columbia, or is it a multi-center New York uh, hospital endeavor? So right now, this is done through our New York Presbyterian Hospital System. So it's not just Columbia, but it's through um, this hospital network. Uh, it's only so far in those hospitals. But based on our success for this, we are figuring out how we can be able to expand this uh, more broadly and really think about this, as I said, as integrating within the public health infrastructure. Not trivial to do. Uh, not trivial to do this on scale. As an example, doing this in New York State, if we were to do this for every baby, we'd need to do it for about 210,000 babies a year. So um, no small feat, but something that we're, we're gaining the experience to know what the pain points are and how to solve for them. Is this all funded by NIH? 
So within this, as you can imagine, this is not inexpensive to do. So in fact, none of this is funded by NIH. Um, NIH, I won't go into all the details, but NIH is able to fund programs that are about this big. People may or may not see this if they're just listening to me, but a very small amount. Uh, this ends up being about two orders of magnitude larger in cost than anything that NIH can fund. And so it's a challenge in terms of as you think about big, bold, new transformative ideas, how do we as a scientific community accomplish these? And so uh, we've done this by putting together many different stakeholders. And I, I don't think any one group could be able to take this on. And truth be told, we're not completely there with the funding. I think we needed to demonstrate that we actually could do this in this first feasibility stage uh, before gaining the resources to do this with what I hope will be at least 100,000 babies to get to the sample size we need to see some of these rare conditions and to know what the outcomes are and that we really can screen for them. So what's the um, actual cost of doing the sequence for each of the, uh, for each baby? So to look at those 250 some odd uh, conditions, what's the, what's the bench cost? So as we started out doing this uh, round number, $1,000 per baby. So okay. thinking about generating the data, interpreting the data, getting it back to folks, cost of about $1,000 per baby. Um, the goal is to be able to do this and get it down by the order of magnitude. Can we get it down to $100 per baby as an example? And in doing that, can we think about the economic impact? Most importantly, the health impact for the baby. But as we think about as a society, how to be able to you know afford doing this, we are doing the economic analysis to understand. But the good thing is sequencing costs are decreasing, analysis interpretation costs are decreasing, more of this can be done in automated ways as we understand what normal variation is for people around the world. And that's one of the critical factors is doing that around the world. Now that $1,000 is a fully loaded cost. That's the interpretation, that's the overhead, that's the PI time and such, right? The sequencing cost must be significantly less than that given that a whole genome sequence can be actually, sequ Illumina could do a whole genome sequence for $1,000 now, right? So uh, even over the course of this study, the sequencing costs have come down, if you can imagine it. And we just yeah. started it, like I said, September 2022, less than a year ago. But already the sequencing costs have come down. I expect they'll continue to come down in terms of this. And so uh, data generation certainly can be done for well less than $1,000 now. Um, but as you said, part of it is the interpretation. And we have study staff that explain the study to everyone, explain yep, you know yep. results to apparently. So, yep. Includes multiple pieces.